Good morning all. I'm Martina Garcia, the director of the CSFI, and it's a great honor today to introduce you this panel on the future of retail banking. We have an amazing panel, hmm? and uh, um, who are going to introduce themselves in a moment, and I'm absolutely thrilled then, to have the opportunity to discuss such an important subject, which many ink has been spent, and uh, <laughs> And it's, uh, you know, it's something that we all, 90%, more than 90% of us have a bank account. We all interact with retail banks and it's uh, an incredible important part of the whole financial services system. So without further ado, Dan, would you like to start introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, thanks, Martina. Uh, I'm Dan Frumpkin, I'm a CEO of Metro Bank. Um, a one of the original challenger banks, probably the original challenger bank, started in uh, in 2010, and um, and now sort of what I would call a mid-sized bank, and and trying to compete in the UK across all sectors. Steve, hi, I'm Steve Bretton. I'm president of the Chartered Banker Institute. Um, I'm also a non-executive director at uh, Bank of Ireland. And I have a small uh, beauty consultancy business where I advise um, small businesses on oh, no. capital structures and, and, and such like. Great. And Margaret? Hi, I'm Margaret Doyle. I am Chief Insights Officer and Partner in Financial Services at Deloitte. Um, I'm also a very proud member of the CSFI Advisory Panel. So um, I'm very pleased to be here with uh, such a distinguished panel. Thank you. So let's start our discussion. Uh, Dan, how do you think the competitive environment is right now with retail banking? How has it changed in the last 12 years since Metro mm. Bank started? Yeah, so 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 Martina, I think it's a I think it's a great question. So so at the end of the day, um, if you go back to, to sort of pre-financial crisis and then through the financial crisis and coming out the other side. I think the bank, the Bank of England, made a decision that that further competition in the sector made sense. It was one of the ways to try to create uh, um, maybe a more stable uh, and more interesting banking sector as you go forward. And therefore, banks like Metro Bank got created. Um, and I think the bank has done a really good job um, of creating new entrants. Uh, I think the approval process to get a bank through, um, while still arduous and takes a fair amount of time to get a bank approved, the reality is, is that it is much more open and accommodating than it was before. Um, and that's created uh, lots of different types of competitors. So you have a Starling that is a digital only player. You have Metro that is a full service bank, everything from corporate to uh, small business and across the piece. You, you, you know, you have other entrants that are carving out niches, uh, Adam Bank and others that, that are trying to attack the market. Um, and it's it's really an interesting landscape. The, the problem, and I think the issue really becomes is, I think the Bank of England done a really nice job getting new entrants into the market. I think we all need to work together to figure out how we deal with this squeezed middle. So, so now that certain banks are becoming of a certain size, like Metro Bank, um, you know the the capital rules and the, and the regulatory regime is pretty similar. I mean, for a bank like Metro that's sort of twenty billion in assets, we have the same regulatory rules and capital regime that NatWest has or Lloyd's has, and and that that's not the same in Europe or uh, in America. And I think again, as the regulatory regime matures and we get into the next phase of growth and the Starlings and the Metros and the Adams, and we get to a certain scale. And, and you know, uh, Steve did great work at Shawbrook, but at Shawbrook's now getting to a certain size as well. You know, it, it, it becomes, a, it becomes a, a real issue for us. And I, and I think that's the challenge because still today, the big four, big six, choose your, choose your analogy. The reality is, is they still control over 80% of the primary current account market. So while there's been lots of new entrants and lots of people are nibbling at the edges, the, the, the big four to big six still control the majority of the primary current account market. And, and that's not really going to change until those mid-tier banks, ourselves, uh, TSB and others, can get to scale. And, and it's hard to get to scale under the current regulatory regime. Okay. So, Steve, Margaret, will you agree with that analysis that is the, re the regulatory regime that is the main barrier to scaling up? So I, I think that I would agree with Daniel, if I may, um, that I guess it, it's a little bit of a mixed report card. And for those who like to read the research, actually, the Financial Conduct Authority a few months ago 
question, which is how competitive is the UK retail banking market? And really, in a way, it's uh, marking its own homework because, of course, a big part of their ambition is to stimulate that competition, um, as well as uh, what the bank is doing, in, the Bank of England is doing in terms of improving stability. So I think as we address this question, we've got to sort of look at the backdrop, and it has been a very tough backdrop for banks. It's been a backdrop where, if you look at the analyst reports, you will see that, um, and if you look at the uh, stock market, you will see that many banks are not making their cost of equity on average across Europe. It's been a very tough environment with low interest rates. It's be, it's an environment where many banks are not even um, trading at their book value. So that tells you something about how investors are thinking of them. Um, and we've just seen a massive wave of re-regulation in the wake of the financial crisis, which has been tough both for incumbents and for the challengers. Um, and, and of course, we've had ring fencing and the senior manager regime come in at the same time. So there's just been a lot for um, both bank incumbents and challengers to contend with. I guess where I might disagree respectfully with, with Daniel is to say that I'm not sure that the regulators can solve for this on their own, because one of the big things I'm sure we'll come on to talk about this, uh, Martina, is we've got a big wave of digitalization mm -hmm. and the massive improvement in the um, in the centrality of data. We see it in other sectors. It's not just banking, but it's certainly coming to banking. And in a world where data is important, scale matters, network effects matter more than ever. And so I suspect that it might be a very difficult task for the regulators to lean against that, that, uh, that kind of huge force that basically favors the big. Stephen, what do you think? I think the question of capital and returns is a little like chicken and an egg. I mean, to a degree, if, if, if you create capital layers, either through tier one capital or uh, subordinated capital or MREL, to a point where you make the banks safe, it, it becomes nigh on impossible for them to cover their cost of equity. So to a degree you end up with a two-tier approach. You end up with the specialist banks, like the one I ran at Shawbrook and Hodge, where you focus on a very narrow asset class, where you can achieve a return on equity in line with your shareholders' expectations, so somewhere between 15 and 20%. But at the end of the day, you're not going to be a big competitor to a NatWest or a Barclays at any point in your, in your life cycle. You certainly don't intend to be, because your economic model is driving the markets that you focus on. Whereas for Metro, Atom, um, TSB, Co-op and these other banks, they are trying to be effective competitors to Barclays and NatWest and the like. Uh, and it is hard for them when you consider the amount of capital that they have to put behind what is a relatively safe banking model, um, certainly compared, say, to the United States, by, for, for example. So I, I think what the regulator has done is it's created if you like, um, more banks, but not necessarily more competition. Well, I'm sure that this is not what they're intended to do, but maybe we could go back to Margaret's point because indeed digitalization is the, is the big thing at the moment. <laughs> and uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the received wisdom, and I really would like to, to have your views, is that it reduces the barriers of entry potentially, and uh, particularly given uh, that the, it's possible maybe to establish a bank without having a physical presence. But at the same time, as Margaret has highlighted, uh, um, there is, the scale effects become uh, <coughs> much more important. So how, how do you feel about digitalization uh, and uh, um, the impact that it will have in uh, introducing more or less competition? I mean, so, so, so listen, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we think we think digitization is is a thing for our customer experience, right? At the end of the day, um, you know, having a good digital offering, um, and again, ours rates pretty well on CMA results and everything else, and we continue to invest pretty heavily in our digital channel. We just we don't think it's substitutional. So so we think it's an and not an or. So so we think the stores have a role to play. I mean, there was um, in 2020, the BBC ran a, a, a report on the future of retail banking and what it looked like and which did a study as part of that. And in 70 percent of the respondents talked about wanting a mix of digital and in person, uh, you know, to be able to access their, their banking services. 
Um, you know, if you look at, at um, the McKinsey work, so the Finalta Digital and the retail banking stuff, you know, Margaret's old shop, and you dig through the data a bit, the reality is, is that digital adoption is getting to near preference rates. And, and, and so that means it's starting to kind of to, to plateau. And, you know, there's still a huge chunk who prefer to go to the stores. And it, it might be less than half, but the reality is that's still a lot of people. And, and, you know, if you start to dig into what people are comfortable doing, so what are their preferences that they're willing to do digitally? Things like moving money or changing personal details, fine. But, you know, it's sort of 25% of customers are comfortable when they get into financial difficulty or dealing with fraud digitally. So, so this face-to-face, this need for kind of a, a blended solution, I think, is, I think, is, really, I think is really important. Um, and, and I don't think that's any different. I mean, you know, I, I know Steve from olden days. Steve is one of the best transactional bankers I've ever met. And the reality is, is he did that by creating a customer experience that had a, a lot of personal touch in it. And the, and the reality is, is that I, I just, I just don't think you ever really get away from that in, in, in financial services. You can, you can do certain bits, right? You can open current accounts, you can move some money, you, you can do certain bits in a very automated way. But at the end of the day, for small businesses and for medium-sized corporates, having somebody to talk to is really important. So yeah. would that um, take us towards market segmentation? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I see this from two perspectives. I, 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 I look at the eye-watering sums that, that, that we spend at Bank of Ireland on, on digital transformation, um, at one point potentially more than the market capitalization of the bank. Um, and, and, and yes, I look at fintechs who are able to create um, uh, Go to market solutions at a fraction of the cost and in a fraction of the time, and I think there's a real dilemma there between in big scale organisations you have massive regulatory compliance requirements and the ability to scale their legacy architecture in a number of cases to, to compete effectively with the digital challenges is is a real big um, I think barrier to progress. Um, at the same time, the digital challenges, a lot of them that I talk to don't want to be banks because they don't want the regulation that goes along with it. They want to provide the rails and the technology and be paid for the rails and the technology, but they don't want any of the stuff that goes with banking. So I think you're going you're gonna to find that digitalization in, in of itself will, will create a different market because what will happen is that inevitably banks – will have to team up with fintechs to deliver the type of products and services that customers want. And it will be different depending on the market segment. And I think, you know, to Dan's point, the SME and the mid-market have been underserved by, by the way that some of the larger banks have tried to commoditize the offerings that are available for those customers. Um, and many criticisms that come from SMEs and mid-sized corporates are because they don't fit a box and they want to talk to somebody about a particular opportunity. And that's why you see people like Thin Cats emerging as, as a credible, you know, realistic, you know, player in the SME market. And they're not a bank. Um, they're using wholesale funding, but they offer a very traditional relationship banking services that a lot of SMEs find appealing. So I, th- I think digitalization um, creates the opportunity for a much more diverse market. But at the same time, as Dan said, Certain customers require that, that want that personal interaction. Metro provide it um, in retail uh, with a very different experience to the traditional banks. And I think people like ThinkCats provide it in SME finance. I mean, I, I think it's certainly right that there is a niche, there are niches that have been underserved in the past. Um, but I think that one of the things coming out is this question of is digitization about that customer experience or to what extent is digitization about everything that you're doing with your data. Um, and you talked about digital transformation, Steve. This is, we are going through this kind of long awaited transition. I mean, I, I was writing about all of this over 20 years ago, you know, this, you know, when we first had the first kind of e-banks, but it's, ta- it's, taking, it's taken us a very long time. But I think that the, we are kind of finally getting to a point where we are having, we have cloud solutions, we have good processing ability. That means that first of all, we're going to be seeing banks massively kind of clean up their data. Having them having the data in the cloud, and also being uh, being able to apply robotic process automation, machine learning, and eventually proper AI to their data for all sorts of things, everything from 
credit con uh, decisions all the way through to you know the whole kind of client experience so i i think that it will be a it will be a much bigger thing and i think that i would agree with stephen dunn that it will be complementary not a substitution in other words that people will want um that the, well both both that the fintechs will be complementary to the banks and that and will team up rather than disrupt them and and similarly that the stores the branches are going to be complementary to the digital experience people will want both and rather than either or yeah and, and margaret you want to touch on this last week a bit and, and the reality is is that i think big data is is a real challenge for challenge yeah. A terrible sentence. But big data is a real challenge for sort of that mid-tier sector because because, you know, having enough data points is going to become important because at the end of the day, you know, people, uh, my son in particular, really likes kind of this recommended thing. You go into Netflix, they recommend a show. You go on Amazon, they recommend, a show, you know, what product. The reality is, is they're modeling like crazy and they only see 10% of, of what a human being does, 15% of, I mean, a tiny piece of your life. Banks, you know, with if we have your primary current account, we pretty much see your whole life. If we can get to a point where we can help you understand yourself better and start to model it in a way that is really both predictive and helpful, then, you know, it's a it's a game changer for how banks fit into the ecosystem of, of, of digital going forward. I, I think I think there's there's something really valuable about having on this on this data point. I mean, I agree with you that scale is rewarded, and I think one of the questions, and you and I touched on it uh, last week, Dan, is you know who 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 is who is who's got the best, who's got the most competitive advantage? Is it the incumbent banks, or maybe is it the tech players? You know, who already have billions of customers, and some of them are developing or have already developed payment uh, system so you know no they don't have the current account but they do they do see all of the payments they see where you are so for me to me the big challenge is not necessarily the fintechs it's the big techs so i mean and i guess dan and steve it's a that that's a question which is who has the most valuable pot of data is it the banks who have this very holistic picture of your whole self in theory at least especially if they have your credit card as well as your current account or is it the big tech that that maybe have got a payments arm or, and are maybe seeing your retail across a very wide range of services, not thinking of any online retailers in particular. I mean, I think the dynamic is changing. I mean, I can remember when I was at Santander and, and Manchester United were putting their credit card out for auction and in a, a very nice shirt turned up in my office with my name on the back and a whole bunch of other bits and pieces and 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 you know it was a question of how much of a check you would write to become Manchester United's credit card provider now people like Manchester United and Qantas and these guys are partnering with fintechs to deliver financial services on their rails they don't need the banks to do it so the dynamic so actually the the availability of information on the customer is arguably more of a risk going forward if you have to be sitting in a bank than it was maybe five, 10 years ago. And, and we talk about open banking, and, and I think open banking is, a, is, a great, uh, is great for consumers um, in terms of the ability for them to share information, see information, but, but it's what the banks do with that information that will either change a customer outcome or not. In, in some ways, in other words, if you use that information to get a fuller picture of the customer and create a better experience or or, or come to a, a different decision about their credit score, well, then open banking has got a lot of merit. But if at the end of the day, you do neither of those things, it's, a, it's an interesting customer experience and that's it. Um, so so I, I think that, that maybe the ability to see somebody's financial 360 degrees is going to become less in the future, maybe the more, because actually you might use your Qantas credit card provided by um, XYZ FinTech because you like to collect air miles, but you might have your mortgage over here and your savings over here. And the ability to aggregate that data in the way that a NatWest or a Santander would have done because they had everything under one roof 10, 15 years ago is less obvious. Um, and I think that's partly also a self-inflicted wound of the big banks because they weren't able to use the data they had to create a better customer experience. I remember at Santander being hugely frustrated by the fact that, that we, we were the second largest mortgage provider in the UK. Um, but when someone wanted to insure their house with us, the first question we asked them was where it was and how many bedrooms it had, even though we just lent them half a million pounds to buy it. Um, and and, and, and that, I think, sums up you know, the fact that big banks have found that joining the dots really tricky. 
Yeah, and, and I, th I think so. It's a question of uh, what do, what do you do with the data? How do you monetize it? And do people want you to monetize it when it's that data? Do you think there's going to be some backlash at that level if banks go much further in monetizing it? So, so certainly when, when we've done research on this, people have said thanks, but no thanks, but um, unless there are rewards. So they, they don't necessarily want it for, you know, necessarily kind of good purposes like ESG, but if there are rewards on offer. So I think that um, there are, people, will, people will generally say no if they're asked that question, but I think the evidence of people's behavior is that they implicitly do um, give away data in, if they feel that they're getting something in return. And, and we found really uh, providing insights to individuals, which we do both on our, our SME platform and our, and our consumer platform digitally, it, it, it makes um, consumers really like it, as do small businesses. So, so again, as long as you're using the data to feed back to them so they better understand themselves, they're more willing to let you do other things with it as well. Okay. And in terms of what we were discussing before also, um, uh, I want to develop this uh, um, theme of uh, uh, what consumers really want and how much they are ready to pay for. Um, in the UK, uh, bank accounts remain uh, seemingly apparently free huh? in most cases, uh, which is not the case everywhere else. And, uh, and obviously, if you have a, a, a strategy, for example, of maintaining a physical presence where others don't, huh? Uh, is there any way of uh, being rewarded for that? Is there any way of monetizing the uh, additional human service? That is a $64 question for, for, for Metro, to be clear. So, so, I mean, at the end of the day, we we've, we've, we've fundamentally have stores that are meaningfully different than anybody else's stores, and they have more human beings in them, and we're open longer hours, and we're open seven days a week, and we do all those things to try to allow access both for uh SMEs, mid corporates, as well as our consumer customers. So at the end of the day, we think the answer to that question is yes. You go back to the Commerce Bank days um, in the States uh, in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s before we sold it to TD. It's pretty evident that they won share by, by having a different physical presence. Um, it helps build brand. I mean, you know, we think it's the right thing to do, but. I can fully understand why others come to the conclusion that we should reduce store hours and shrink our store estate and shrink the number of people in a store. And it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's going to be an interesting thing to unfold. All the research we've done seems to indicate that, that the stores really do add value and, and, and they're incrementally accretive and, and provide a good return for us. So, so we're, we're pretty happy with them, but, but it is a, it's a meaningful differentiator for us. And, and, you know, we, we think, you know, back to your financial inclusion question, I, th I think we have more cash accounts than I think almost anybody in the UK, which you can say, oh, well, that just clogs up your system. Why would you want so many cash accounts? I um, mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure that conversation occurred at Chanted there and elsewhere. The reality is, is that we fundamentally believe, and this goes back to our founder and everybody else, that, that inclusion in, in, in financial services is a thing. And it's a thing we're hugely supportive of. And we want to make sure everybody who walks in our store has the same experience, whether they're opening up a low value cash account or they're going to end up in, in our private banking business. So, so um, we, we think the stores have a huge role when it comes to financial inclusion, when it comes to, to consumer duty, when it comes to you know, vulnerable customers. Mm -hmm. we, we, we think the stores have a huge role to play. And, and, and it's a big part of always been the, the thesis behind our stores. Yeah. Retail banking is, is, is like is like any retail business. It's about the footprint and it's about the proposition. Um, and and you know, I you know, I learned when I said at Santander that you know it sounds blindingly obvious, but but branches that have a high footfall tend to be successful. Um, you know, and I remember moving branches around in Glasgow to follow shopping centers, for example, because because of the I was following the consumer. Now, I mean, the days of having seven or eight branches in Nottingham or something, it was way, that's way behind us. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, in key concentrations of population, you, yeah, there is, I think, merit in having a retail, a physical retail presence. And, and I also think there's merit in having a physical presence to support SMEs in that, in that space as well. Um, you know, the, the days of when you know a big branch provider would have over two thousand branches is, is, is that's way behind us, but you know five hundred six hundred branches as an optimum footprint in the UK I don't think is unrealistic. Um, so 
but you have to complement it with digital. You have to complement it with apps. Maybe you have to complement it with call centers. Um, so it's, it's about building out a retail proposition and thinking about it in the way that Next or Marks and Spencers or, or other successful retail brands would think about it. Um, and, and therefore, I, I don't think it's an either or answer. I, I think it's about how you do it, not whether you do it. And, and I think Daniel made a really interesting point about financial inclusion. And, and I think and, and that kind of tension between the cost and benefit of having stores or branches and, you know, the, the benefit to customers versus the cost. But I mean, the other the other area where, of course, where banks are wrestling with a similar dilemma is over cash and not just banks, but because I think it's a question for society more broadly, which is, um, do we all have access to cash? We saw the pandemic accelerated what was already a pre-existing trend away from cash usage. Um, so dramatically accelerated that. You know, we, we, you, you would probably see there are lots of cafes that will say they're ca- they are cashless only. Um, and I think there are big questions for society, and particularly for the most vulnerable, over this whole question about whether it's access to cash or access to particular branches. And we know that there are certain demographics that are particularly affected by that. You know, generally those who are less well off, generally those who are older, perhaps um, with some sort of um, mental illness. So I think that just it, we, we've got to realise that this is not just about the specific cost benefit to the organisation, but there are broader societal questions at play. In, in other places like in, in China, for example, uh, a lot of the financial inclusion is uh, to a certain extent delivered by the likes of WeChat, which is very similar to WhatsApp. Hmm? Do you, and, uh, and many small businesses are run with through WeChat accounts hmm? with very little links to uh, the banking system. Do you do you imagine a future like that in the UK, or or is it unrealistic? I, I'm I'm too American at times. So to be clear, I do carry a British passport, but I'm too American at times. So I mean, you know, America, we we love our cash. So so I I, I have a hard time seeing beyond um, seeing beyond that. I think for me, uh, but you know, it's not inevitable that that you get to 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 a place where where. Um, there's another provider of, of sort of low value um, accounts for small SMEs and, and consumers who are more vulnerable. But I don't know. I, I think we have a pretty good banking infrastructure. We're, we're better off just asking the banks to do more. I think, I, I think that's probably the best solution. Yeah, I mean, I mean, another great success in the in the UK is contactless payments, right? And yeah. we saw a huge acceleration. I think it's really interesting whether it's open banking or contactless to see whether, whether there are certain use cases that expand usage. So for contactless, it was when Transport for London, TFL, accepted contactless. And suddenly, you know, a lot of people who hadn't bothered with it started using it. Similarly, I saw the um, open banking implementation executive talked about how HMRC suddenly allowed kind of, uh, you know, a, a very easy banking payment. And that, again, massively expanded the use of open banking apps. So I think that there's, there is, um, I, th- I think it is a good thing if we allow businesses, you know, maybe to have their little, their little pad and so suddenly you've got the hairdresser, the, the cabbie who's able to accept payments in a way that they might not have been 10, 20 years ago. But equally, I, I think to Daniel's point, we have got a very, we've got an old and very robust um, banking infrastructure and payments infrastructure in this country. And um, so we don't need to kind of reinvent the wheel. Yeah, I, I think uh, Margaret makes a good point. I mean, the amount of contactless transactions that take place has increased exponentially. And, and actually, you know, that is that that is a fee generating um, series of, of transactions, not just for the, the rails, but also for the banks. And, and actually far more effective for them in terms of profitability than moving cash around the countryside and and, and sticking lots of uh, notes into, into ATMs. Um, so it's a question of how you adapt your business model to reflect the needs of your customers going forward. And, and over a period of time, you know, the, the customer base that, that you will find will, will change um, because people's habits and the way that they choose to acquire things and pay for things um, will, will be different as generations pass on. So I, I think, I, I, I don't think, it, as I said previously, I don't think it's about you know, the end of retail banking, I think it's a different chapter in the evolution of retail banking. Yeah. Speaking of revolutions and having to serve the customer and all this adaptation, we haven't been speaking about uh, 
uh, stuff about people, about talent. Um, and, uh, and obviously for them, it's also quite a big challenge, yes? And that teams up with uh, uh, the, the whole revolution of working from home, of hybrid working at the moment. Um, Margaret, I think you, you have been doing some research on that. Yeah. How, what is your view? So, so there are a few different pieces of research that we've done. So one piece of research, which we did a few years ago, we did we, we used some global data from Universum to look at how attractive careers in banking and insurance were. And one of the things, I mean, I think a really striking thing that we found was that banking was falling in popularity as a destination for business students around the world. And there were a number of reasons for that. Um, so that's definitely a challenge for banks, that because certainly in my day, you know, the banks, particularly the investment banks, were seen as really the kind of, you know, top destinations for university graduates. So that's that's definitely a challenge. But also, in addition to the whole question of, you know, the overall numbers, there was a question about the perception of banks. And we felt that there was a kind of an old-fashioned perception of banks. The, the sort of people who went for banks saw them as being prestigious um, and, you know, very well-paying, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot about extrinsic motivation, um, but they didn't see them as being good on things like, um, you know, corporate social responsibility. They didn't see them as being good on gender diversity. So they didn't see them as being innovative. So there was also something there about actually the banks absolutely need a sort of a very different sort of talent than what they've needed in the past. I mean, Steve and, and Daniel have been talking about, you know, the creativity that is now needed in banking. So there's definitely a challenge there for banks. And then we also did some research during the pandemic, which showed that there was differential experience of the pandemic um, depending on the kind of age cohort. So we saw, you know, the people who are older, the so-called Gen Joneses, which is a little bit older than Gen Xs, um, you know, the people basically typically running banks, that they, you know, they were they were fine during the pandemic, whereas the younger generation felt disaffected, they felt alone, they, they didn't feel a sense of psychological safety, they didn't feel able to speak up. So I think that there's there's there are definitely challenges there for banks, particularly now given, first of all, that we're in a very hot labour market here in the UK and in, in most of the Western world, um, but, but also just given that the type of person that you want to attract to, to banks is quite different from maybe 5, 10, 20 years ago. Stephen Dan, will, will you agree that you're facing a, in a, a challenge in terms of recruiting the right talent? I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, clearly at the Chartered Bank Institute, we... we we're focused on helping bankers develop their professional skills. Um, and if you look at the, the suite of um, programs that we offer in 2022 versus what we offered in 2012 or even 1992, I mean, it's, it's you know, chalk and cheese. Um, it's, it's, it's changed so much. And that's reflective of, of the needs of, of bankers that we work with, not just in the UK, but in Australia and Malaysia and, and globally. Um, and that's going to continue to be the case. I think that what, what banks have got to do in terms of attracting talent is they've got to find a way, and I think this is a perennial problem for banks, of, of attracting entrepreneurial, creative people um, who, who want to see and make change, but can work within a risk environment and, and, and get that balance right. And it's very, very hard. Um, there's a natural default position in banks to, to talk about risk and conduct, and, and conduct is another variation of risk and non-financial risks. And, 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 you know, and we spend hours on the boards that I sit on looking at risks from every single dimension you possibly could do. And it does stifle entrepreneurialism and creativity. Um, and, and, and you've got to find a balance because, because ultimately you need the creative and the entrepreneurial you need the interaction with society, you need to be engaged, but at the same time, you've got to be aware of the risks that, that, that you're running. Um, I think Monzo is a really interesting case study because it's developed some really sort of, I think, you know, great products. It's seen as a very, you know, um, go-to brand with certainly the younger generation, but it's struggled to make money because it's really struggled to, to, to find a way to monetize a massive client base because ultimately, you, you make your money in banking because you, there's a spread between the, the price you pay on deposits and the, and, the, and the price you charge customers, and you try not to lose too much of it along the way. Um, and actually, you know, therefore, you've got to be risk attentive, but you've also got to find a way to allow creativity and entrepreneurialism 
and, and perhaps a more engaging approach to your customers. So I think it's interesting to see how you can take a great brand, which has had some really great traction like a Monzo, and actually turn it into a very profitable entity. Um, and that, that, I think, actually does require entrepreneurism and creativity as much as risk management. So I, yeah, that's, that's how we think about things at the Charter Banker Institute in terms of the way we help people develop their careers. Um, and I think that's going to continue to be the case if, if banking is going to compete for, for talent who understand and can manage risk but can be entrepreneurial and creative at the same time. And also, you know, younger people want to have a sense of purpose um, and they want to see they're making a contribution to the world. Um, and, you know, and then there are still cases where banks have perhaps, you know, said they're going to do one thing, certainly with regard to environmental issues and done something different. And, and that doesn't help our industry at all. Yeah, and I, I think there's just a couple of bits in there. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be relatively quick. So, so first of all, you know, at, at Metro, we, we do realize that to attract um, the candidates we want, we, we need to have a higher purpose. Back to Margaret. So, so, so we really we spend a lot of time making sure that that our culture aligns with something beyond just making money or yeah, that there's there's a reason we exist. Um, and, and we've got that pretty well honed in. We try to, uh, a phrase we use internally, which, um, you know, I, I like, but I can get sounds a little American. And that is, you know, we hire for attitude and train for skill. So at the end of the day, for a lot of the colleagues we bring in into our stores or into our call centers in AD or even into some of our main central roles, we really, we want them to fit culturally and we'll teach them what they need to know. Back to Steve, Steve's point, which is a good one, this entrepreneurial, this bit of flair that you want in somebody. Okay, we need to kind of teach them about risk and teach them about how to be balanced. Um, but at the end of the day, you don't want to lose the flair and you don't want to lose the entrepreneurial spirit. And, and I think that's hugely important to us. And again, we use the Charter Banker. It's a big deal for our store colleagues to get their designations. I mean, you know, they're, they're really excited about it. We do a big celebration for graduations. We encourage the further education. Um, and, you know, we're a hugely diverse organization because we think it's the only way to make effective decisions. So, so again, all, all, our colleagues look like there's all our store colleagues look like the locations they're in. So, again, they're representing the communities they operate in. Um, and across the board, we're more diverse than the UK. So we have um, and, and we take that very seriously and continue to work on it. And and, and we think that leads us to, to better decision making. So. Again, you know, hiring and ha being able to attract in quality candidates is, is it's more than a pay scale. It's more than a it's a, OK, tell me how you're going to grow me. Tell me how you're going to help me learn. Tell me, you know, that, that you're you celebrate diversity. Tell me why I can be myself at work and that there's some kind of a higher purpose where, listen, th this business only works because of the colleagues. Full stop. Right. There's there's nothing else that matters as much as having an engaged group of colleagues who genuinely care about the customer. That's it. I, I can do all the math in the background and I quite like math. I can, I can do all those kinds of good bits, but if we don't have the colleagues understanding the culture, aligned to it and delivering for the customer, we're done. And, and Martina, may I, if I just may yeah. add something there that, that Daniel talked about diversity and inclusion. And I think that, you know, that, that really does matter nowadays. It's been one of the seismic shifts since certainly since I started work uh, in London, you know, some decades ago. And, but, but it's not just something that matters to the kids. Uh, and yes, it does matter to young, uh, to, particularly to young graduates, but it's something the regulators really care about. I mean, you, you saw DP one and two, discussion paper one and two that came out last summer, a combined discussion paper from the Bank of England, the PRA, the FCA, and they all came together and said, this really matters. And it matters not just because it's the right thing to do, but because of the concern about groupthink, about the concern about psychological safety, about the ability to speak up. So if you're in a sector, a highly regulated sector like banking, you really need to know that people are not, that they're not suffering from groupthink and that if people do think that something is going wrong, they will stick up their hand and they'll say something about it. And mm -hmm. so certainly for boards, boards really need to take this seriously. This isn't just about group hug. This is about serious risk management. And that is the message coming from the regulators. And they are holding they are holding senior managers, they are holding boards to account. And I'm sure that Steve has had several conversations um, with your friends, uh, you know, with his chartered banker hat on. 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's um, I'm I, I'm a little saddened by it in some ways, in as much as I I think, to my mind, doing the right things for customers is a natural behaviour. It's not a conduct risk. Um, and yet it's become a. We talk about it in a negative frame of mind rather than a positive frame of mind. Yeah, I, I think I'm yeah, for me when I look back on my banking career. The creation of the one, two, three account at Santander and the way that we thought about that and our customers is the highlight of my career, and I'm very proud of it. Um, and 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 it was designed for families, um, and and that was the great thing about it. And and I think that we should think about the way that banks evolve in a positive frame of mind rather than in a negative frame of mind. As soon as you attach the word risk to something, you automatically get a negative connotation rather than a positive connotation. And, and I think, you know, when we're thinking to attract um, people into the industry, we want them to understand um, the expectations of the regulators, but equally then to ensure that the, those, the expectations of the customer are met alongside the expectations of the, of, the, of the regulator. And that it's seen as a behavioral characteristic that you do the right thing for the customer, not a mitigation of a conduct risk. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are some things we could do as an industry to make ourselves more attractive to, to people who are thinking about their careers. Um, to one of Dan's points, I mean, I think there's something fantastic about the opportunity of listening to a small business guy or a medium-sized business talk about an aspiration for their business and then lending them the money to turn that aspiration into a reality. And certainly during my career as an SME banker, you know, I, I did a lot in the leisure industry. I loved going to hotels that I'd seen on pieces of paper that were then working and had customers in them and staff there. And you know, the, the idea of helping create a small business which creates employment for people is a fantastic opportunity. Um, and we don't talk enough about that in terms of a career opportunity in banking. I would like to go back, thank you very much. I would like to go back a bit to the data aspect, yes, and, uh, and, uh, and FinTech. And I was wondering, listening to you also about the mixture of entrepreneurship and risk, whether the uh, the trend towards uh, um, developing partnerships and M&A with fintech could not be providing some type of um, avenue to merge the two in the right way and buy this entrepreneurship uh, spirit and bringing it into the banks. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm happy. I'm happy to go first, but then Margaret, I, I yeah. you know, over top of a bit of an industry perspective. So, you know, we're we're um, again a bit of the poster child because I mean, we bought Ratesetter, right? And Ratesetter was the one of the original peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Is a it was a fintech before I think the phrase fintech got used, and and really was and still is technolo technologically more advanced than than Metro is, right? It, it has a .NET infrastructure that allows us to make change much quicker. It's slick, it's fast, it's plumbed into all the aggregator sites. Um, you know, we make credit decisions in, in in number of seconds, not not in days, and it's really good. And and you know, we knew we needed an unsecured lending platform. So back to Steve's point, you make a spread and that's how you make money as a bank. And, and we were struggling to, to, to lend money. And so we thought, okay, what's it going to cost to build it? And went and did the analysis about what it cost to build it and how we would grow it. And, and then we scanned the market for people who are really good at it already to try to determine if there was a better solution for us. And the reality is, is that, you know, that buy versus build is a, is a, is a discipline that I think you know, everybody needs to adopt because there are things that the people in the market are much better at than than an established bank. And that's fine. That's great. And and you should just go either try to figure out a partnership model, sort of, you know, like a thin cats does because they take some money from some banks or or a funding circle, or you you end up making the acquisition and and actually building it in. I will say the challenge with those acquisitions is you need to you need to work very hard to protect the DNA of what you're buying because at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's a temptation from all sort of, well, anybody in any industry who's been around for a long time. So I don't want to just say bankers, but any, you know, your, your temptation is to make it look like you. And if you make it look like you, you're in real trouble. So, so you need to leave it looking like a FinTech owned by a bank. Um, but it's worked out great. I mean, honestly, it's been, one of the better decisions I've made since I arrived, yeah. So Margaret, how do you see the industry at that level developing? Do you see then uh, the fintechs are going to develop on their own or it's a world of partnerships and, uh, I think and incumbents 
using, uh, well, buying them and absorbing that innovation? Well, I think that one of the fun, exciting things about being involved in banking and financial services more broadly right now is that it is complex. There's a lot of stuff going on. I don't think there is one solution. I think that, you know, to Daniel's point, sometimes it makes sense to buy as long as you make sure that you kind of nurture that that your, your acquisition very carefully. Sometimes it makes sense to partner. Um, so I think that, that this is the really exciting things, partic- thing, particularly here in London. I think we have got a very vibrant fintech sector. I think that in the Financial Conduct Authority, we have got a regulator that is really doing some of the right things in terms of things like the regulatory sandbox about sort of having that balance of regulation right between, you know, supervision, a little bit of supervision, but not too much supervision. It's something that's envied the world over. So I, I don't think there's a single answer. I do, what, where I do agree with both Steve and Dan is that I think that the good news is that for the most part, I think fintechs and the kind of classic incumbent banks are complements and not substitutes of one another. I think a few years ago, and certainly I went to one or two big fintech rallies a few years ago in you know, places like Wembley, where it was all, you know, the banks are dead and, you know, we're kind of, we're the future. And I actually think that things have evolved. I think it's more of an evolution than a revolution. I think what the fintechs generally provide is sustaining innovation rather than disruption of the established order. You know, to Dan's point, it takes a lot of money and time to build scale. Customer acquisition is expensive. We've seen that there's a lot of stickiness of customers, and therefore it's extremely difficult, even for the the you know the best fintechs with with some you know with you know, even those that have acquired a lot of customers, they've acquired a lot of customers, but often they don't have big balances or they don't have so many transactions. So, I think that in the end we will end up with a huge amount of collaboration that will take many different forms. Stephen, how, how is that collaboration and open banking and the movement towards more open data, how is that injected competition then? Because if we are not going to have this new entrance taking over, huh, we are back into where Dan started, uh, um, you know, yes, new, uh, very difficult to really become big and to change the scale and to change the market. How do you think, uh, do you think open banking has... Um, Injected innovation and uh, competition. I, I don't. I don't think open banking has. I, I think the the competition has arisen for, from other factors. So um, I think it. I think it is. You know, the PRA and the SCA have. I think made the process of applying to become a bank a lot more accessible. But more importantly, technology has allowed people who would have balked at the cost of setting up a bank to be able to access technology and effectively a bank in a box type solution for a fraction of the cost of of what it would have been X years ago, or indeed what it costs a a decent sized bank to run their technology. I mean, you you can set up a bank in terms of technology cost for probably under five million pounds, maybe even closer to, to three. Um, and, and, and I, we're not giving too many trade secrets away. I think probably that's what, what, what we at Bank of Ireland pay someone to advise us on our, our technology system, let alone build one. Um, so, 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 so the reality is, is that I think technology and, and the regulatory environment has created the opportunity for competition. But the scaling of those small fish into bigger fish is very, very hard. And very few of them will will become bigger fish. And indeed, many of them don't want to be. So therefore, you're left with this inevitable question, which is how many big banks does a country of 60 million people really need? Um, and, 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 what, and what is the answer? And I'm not professing that I know the answer, but I don't think it's 60. And actually, maybe it is somewhere between six and ten. Um, and six and ten can be effective. I mean, in Ireland, we're down to three, right? Um, smaller country, um, but it's caused a lot of issues with the with the Irish government about whether a country that used to have five banks and is now going to have three, whether that's a, a retrograde step or, or not. And I think the conclusion hasn't yet been reached by the competition authorities yet, is that they're having to assess whether three pillar banks and a collection of fintech competitors creates the right competitive dynamic for the future. And I think the UK may very well be six to eight big banks with a, with a range of specialists and fintech competitors around the edges. 
Um, and they might be look, they might look like a Shawbrook or a Paragon in terms of particular specialisms. They might look like a Monzo or a Revolut in terms of being fintech and payment orientated. They might be like Oak North in terms of a specialist. And then you know you've got the big four guys, and 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 I think a reasonably good bunch of championship style banks um, who can you know with good management and good products make a successful living and a good return on equity. So I I I don't I think open banking has a number of positives, but I think there are more influential elements on competition in the way that it's evolved and the way it will evolve than open banking per se. Okay. Well, that takes me very neatly to my last question that was about, you know, what is the future look like, you know, and whether uh, retail <coughs> banking um, banks are going to continue existing. And Margaret has already answered that, but you have already started answering what the landscape is going to look like. <laughs> and um, Dan, I will, I will, uh, I would really like to have your view of what you think. Uh, what, how Metro is going to look like in uh, 10, 20 years? And uh, and what will the, the rest of your competitors look like? Yeah, it's um, it's a question we spend a fair amount of time thinking about, actually. So so as we decide um, uh, the future, uh, we, spend, we spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about what a decade or 15 years looks like. So I think if you go out 15 years, 10 or 15 years, we think stores still have a role to play. We think there is, uh, uh, you need to be really slick digitally. You're going to need to be really slick on the phone. And the phone's not going to be the phone. It's going to be, you know, a, 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 a remote face-to-face -face experience because everything's kind of moving in that direction. So so the, I think inevitably, as you think about why banks exist, they exist for the whole purpose of disintermediating funds, right? Let's, let's not forget what banking was and why FDR worked to save it and Gordon Brown worked to save it. It's, they didn't work to save it because they like bankers. They worked to save it because the macro economy needs somebody to aggregate deposits and then and then dole them out in little chunks to various businesses to help them grow. It, it's it's why we exist. I, I don't I don't think the purpose of that can ever change because actually a fractional finance infrastructure is critical to have a a growing economy. So 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 there needs to be that process in place. Um, and I think that's a that's a given. Now, what part is fintech and what part isn't fintech? I do worry a little bit that that some of our our key stakeholders get attracted to the shiny penny a bit, and they get attracted to 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 the oh look at this fintech, and then they try desperately to encourage little businesses that that eat away niches around the 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 whale of the big banks. The dilemma at some point you you can actually you know I don't know what the phrase is, but you could like nick an artery and actually damage the big banks. You, you've got to be very careful that what we really need is a banking system that allows us to disintermediate funds support macro and macro growth we need to make sure there's a there's a there's a good blend as as we go forward and open banking is a good example i think it's done really well in like unsecured personal lending it's helped it helps uh, underwrite mortgages and has created some efficiencies for us but but the reality is is that how far you take that you do need to make sure that you're not damaging the pnl of of the industry that you need to to actually disintermediate funds and and continue to allow the macro environment to grow you know if you chase the shiny penny you, you might ignore actually the thing that drives the majority of your macro activity yeah that's great. Well, in any case, as an economist, I am now convinced that this is a, a contestable oligopoly huh? and, uh, and very segmented in terms of where the competition comes from in uh, each of the different areas of the business. And, uh, and uh, it has changed my view of uh, how retail banking is going to go forward um, um, and how the regulators will then uh, try to inject competition. Um, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we will soon have the occasion to see you again in uh, the CSFI. Thank you.